Okay, so we are working on the seat bases. And as you can see, I've got them resting in the boat. This is the rear seat base and the front seat base, although it's kind of blocked by the bridge deck here. Um, and what I've done is I cut all the pieces, uh, rough fit everything, checked my angles, checked my seat back to where it was going to land on the seat base, and went ahead and glued and assembled them. Now I used the same 16 gauge pin nails to assemble all of this uh, with epoxy and while everything was still wet and semi movable what I did was I, I lined everywhere where epoxy could drip I put pieces of wax paper down and then I slipped the seat base into position while it was still movable you know while the epoxy was still wet and then I pulled my measurements um, from frame two back to it and then over on this side frame two back to it to make sure it was perfectly square in the boat and then I'm gonna let it sit there and cure um, I could have assembled these outside of the boat in fact I did assemble them outside the boat but I could have let them cure outside of the boat the problem is when you go to put it back in the boat if your seat base was just slightly skewed I mean by a couple degrees it would not fit in the boat and you would have to sand and grind and cut to make it fit squarely in the boat where you want which is why I wanted to get it glued up set in the boat and and squared in the boat and let it cure in the boat this way when I take it back out to do final sand work and fit work it is it's square to the boat um, that's very very important had I let these cure outside there's a, a solid 70% chance they would not have dropped in. And if you did get them to drop in, the measurements probably would not be accurate because it would be very difficult without building a jig to keep everything perfectly square. So I'm letting the boat be my jig. Assembled it, glued it, dropped it in here. And you can see, like I've talked about in the past, any place where you know epoxy could possibly drip and accidentally adhere it to the boat, I put wax paper down so that that can't happen um, so there's the rear seat or seat base and come up to the front here's the front seat base and they're identical they're identical in in front height in rear height in depth and width they're exactly the same uh, front and back seat so it is just a hair over 17 inches like 17 and a quarter from this back side face to this front side face and I really actually like that it hid these rows of screws. You won't see them. So looking, you know, looking forward, it'll just look like the planks continue all the way up to frame four, even though obviously they don't, and our storage is underneath the seat. So let's talk about some measurements. Up at the front of the seat, this is two and a half inches depth or height, two and a half inches. It slopes an inch down to one and a half inches. So that gives you a slight recline, and you can see that slight recline against the armrest over here. So why did I, why did they go so shallow? Well, number one, there's not a, a whole bunch of leg room under the steering wheel. So like I've talked about in the past, I wanna keep my seat bases very, very, very low. As low as I comfortably can. Um, so what I did was I wanted my seat height in the front to come out about level with the armrests. So, We've got two and a half inches. Now I decided to use a piece of half inch marine ply for my actual seat base that the upholstery will be attached to. So you got two and a half inches plus that half inch thick marine ply that'll go all the way across here. Then you have the two inch um, high density foam on the top of that. So you got the two and a half plus the half is three plus the two inch foam will put it flush right up here at the tip. And then as it goes towards the back of the seat, it'll be below the armrest back here by about one inch. And uh, so that'll give you a slightly reclined seating position. Um, I put these center supports roughly where you're going to be sitting, uh, one here and one for the passenger. The front seat, I had some extra one inch thick stock. So I, I just made these middle supports out of the one inch thick. The sides, that side, this side, and the face and the rear are all 13 sixteenths. On the rear seat, 
um, it's all 13 sixteenths. Just because I didn't want to, I didn't want to whack another piece of really, really nice. I've got my one inch board that the dash was made out of sitting over there. And I didn't want to whack any more off of that than absolutely necessary. Um, so this is all that's left of those really, really wide planks that I bought to do the armrests. There was enough to do the armrests and both seat bases out of, which I was hoping for. So we're making good progress. I did the exact same thing. Um, some more measurements from the inside of this seat base part, the port side. So inside of this to inside of this one is 12 inches. And then over here, same thing, 12 inches. That leaves about a 16 inch in the center. Roughly, that's just a guess. Um, but it was most important to me that these, these supports were right under about where your bottom's going to be. Uh, so there was good support on that. And the, the rear is the exact same thing. It's all the same measurements, identical in every way. 12 inches between here, 12 inches between here. Um, so what I did to locate those was I put a straight edge on here and I ran it down so that this edge right here, this face, is on the exact same plane as this here. It meets right at this corner. So when I put that, uh, that half inch marine ply, run it down, it'll match up dead even with this edge. Um, so when I squared these seat bases in here, I squared them so that that was gonna end up dead even and then took this measurement from here up to my gusset and I matched it on the other side. Uh, and that turns out to be eight and five eighths inches. Eight and five eighths from the face here to the face of the gusset, eight and five eighths. On the rear seat, it's a slightly different measurement, still pretty close, but from the face here to the face of this little tiny gusset you can see, that is seven and a half inches. So the rear seat's about an inch closer to the dashboard than the front seat. Uh, but again, same exact story, I, I ran my straight edge, you know, down that 12 degree until I met this very edge back here so that when my ply's on, it'll meet up perfect. And, and then check my measurement and then match both sides. So that's a long-winded description of the seat bases, but this is information that is very, very, very difficult to find um, from the Glenel website or anybody else that's, that's built a zip in particular. Um, I was able to finally get a, a official width measurement from another zip builder. I was very, very happy about that. His turned out to be 47 inches, mine is 45, so I'm two inches narrower than him on the seat overall width. But, you know, 45 to 47 is, it seems to be pretty common for the seat base width in a zip. Um, so if you're in that range, you'll pretty well nail it. Uh, making fantastic progress. Again, the seat bases are in here wet and at their correct measurements squared two frame two and squared two frame four and i'll let them cure up like this so then tomorrow i'll get them pulled back out after they're nice and cured get everything sanded all the angles nice and smoothed in and belt sanded flush and i'm going to have to build much like the the vertical parts of my armrest the little blocks that are on the inside that screw to the floor planking i'll do something probably uh, six per seat base on this little blocks that will screw down and then there'll be two screws on each side so that the seat bases will be Attached very very well, but removable. That's the important part if I ever need to take Floor planks out, you know, who knows drop my keys in there. I don't know I need to be able to remove the seat back the seat base and a couple of floorboards so I can get in there and get stuff out if I need to or if I need to make repairs this needs to be removable so there's an incredibly long-winded uh, description of the seat bases, why I made them that way, how I made them that way. Again, they're all assembled with the 16-gauge brad nails, and after they cure up, I'll, I'll put little tiny amounts of famo wood in each hole to plug them up, sand them down, and continue on, but making fantastic progress. So I just want to do a really quick video of this, this cool thing that I didn't know existed. Um, this is a this is obviously my disc sander and you can see here the disc is all plugged up 
not real bad, but it's plugged up with, you know, sanding debris, wood, wood fibers, um, sawdust. It's still pretty grippy, but this is something really cool I didn't know anything about. So I actually had one of these. Um, and it just says it's, it's a handheld cleaner and they're not intended for belt conveyors or feed type sanders. I actually had this given to me along with my my uh, jack plane and I didn't know what it was. This has been sitting in the package under my bench collecting dust for freaking years. But I stumbled on this the other day and I thought, ooh, I wonder if that would work for this thing. So I wanted to kind of give you a demo. So we're gonna fire up the Gary the Snail disc sander. And this stuff is, it's kind of like a, a rubbery compound. It's weird, it's like, rubber with sand in it I don't know I can't explain it but take this guy and you just run it across that disc just applying a little very very slight pressure there it is so now we'll shut the disc sander off and this thing's probably gonna last me, geez, I don't know, for the next 40 years. I've, I've cleaned this disc probably about eight times and that's all I've used, this little corner of it. But, I keep this in a bag, sealed up and rolled up right here on the disc sander. But take a look at that disc now. I mean, it's like, uh, I won't say it's new, but it's dang near new. It looks really, really good. And you know, here's some of the little sanding fibers that came off of it, but never heard of a, a cleaner or disc cleaner before. But man, does that thing work good. So that's gonna prolong the life of my already really inexpensive stick-on sanding discs. Pretty cool, yeah? All right, so I have started some of my wiring today. You can see the little tags on there labeled ground. Um, so I'm working on wire and gauges and stuff. Again, this is really, really slop right now. It'll all be nice and zip tied and in order and, and uh, a really clean looking harness when I'm done. I've always prided myself on my 12 volt wiring harnesses. Um, so it'll look really clean. Well, let's go over some of the features here. Because I'm using this GM headlight switch first pull and you'll get dash lights as well as you can see this red and black up here those are for my uh, my bow light there'll be another one that runs back to the stern light but the bow light stern light and the dash lights all come on with the full first pull of the headlight switch so there they are you can see them lit up hopefully now what's really cool is because I used a GM headlight switch they're dimmable. So if I start rolling this to the right, they'll get dimmer and dimmer, and there they're out. And there they're just, just coming on. Let's see if we can see it a little better, and then we'll go brighter and brighter and brighter. There it is, full brightness. So, that's one of the, one of the features of the switch. Dimmable dash lights, but it will not affect the bow and stern light because it's a separate separate circuit even though it's activated by the same pole of the switch so we now have dash lights now check this out this took a little thinking to do and some wiring to make it happen so we'll shut off the dash lights um, what I did was I whacked into the factory harness this is my receiver box back here for my interior lights my LED strip lights so I cut into that receiver box and the dome light feature um, on this headlight switch um, closes and opens a ground. Well, because my LEDs maintain a constant 12 volt positive and then they, they vary the voltage on the ground, I couldn't, I couldn't use this switch directly to run my LED lights on the ground side because there's three separate grounds and it varies the voltage. However, I could interrupt the positive side. So what I did was I used the ground from here, from my headlight switch, 
into a sugar cube relay where I'm using the ground to actually turn it on and off and that um, sends power out the output side of the sugar cube relay to the 12 volt side of my lights. It took a little thinking to do, but I had already pre-planned this. So if you turn this switch to the left, um, let's try to get them all in one picture. Boom, interior lights, look at that. And if you listen, you can probably hear that solenoid click on and off, I'm gonna shut them off. That little sugar cube relay. So I'm controlling my interior lights off of this switch by opening and closing the ground circuit to activate the relay kind of backwards from how the relays are supposed to work um, but I had a really good feeling it was gonna work so so there's our our interior lights turn them back off so now we'll go you can do interior lights only or you can do dash lights running lights with interior lights if you so choose but we're making fantastic progress on the wiring knocking things down so here's another feature that I forgot to mention I have my ACC wired up off my key switch to send power to all the gauges it doesn't involve the light circuit in the gauges but it actually all of the power to the gauges to run them is controlled off of this switch so See if I can get them both in the same frame. I'll turn the key on and you'll see all the gauge needles move. So we're reading voltage. You can see the tack has moved up to zero. Uh, fuel is empty because there's nothing in there. And the, the speedo, we're not moving at all. So obviously there's not gonna be any speedometer, but I'll turn the key back off. You'll see all the needles drop. There it is. So I'm gonna turn them on one more time. You can watch the needles go up and back off you can actually see the fuel needle move just a little bit but making fantastic progress so real quick here um, today I've got the uh, stereo halfway wired in um, all the power and ground and stuff's done this speaker why is wired in but it's the only speaker so far of the four that's wired so we've only got one but the cool part about this deck and, and part of the reason I got it was because you can match the LED colors of the keys and the display to whatever the interior color is I've already played with it every color of the rainbow that the LEDs in the boat make I can match on the deck so anyhow just playing around with it so some real quick wiring talk um, obviously we're getting more and more and more wires behind the dash um, and again when it's done when I've got all of the wires to their destinations um, then I'll come back and start harnessing all of this up and zip tying it and getting it nice and clean and uh, a real professional looking harness right now it just looks like wire spaghetti uh, here's the back side of my GM switch you can see the various wires all labeled with what they go to um, so as it happens um, I'm a bit of a pack rat and for about the last 10 to 12 years I've got this box here that is just packed full with wire um, you can see there's black wire there's red wire um, there's double single wire like speaker wire I mean there's just bags and bags and bags of this stuff and anytime I work on something or you know let's say I pick up a vehicle and there's a whole bunch of excess stereo wire crap in it I'll yard it all out and I've, I've been collecting this stuff for years um, I only keep you know wire that's in decent shape that hasn't been all kinked or, or has any of the covering or shielding skinned off the side of it so I've got a pretty decent collection so as you see, all of this wire in the boat, everything up to this point, I haven't had to purchase. I actually had all of this here. The only thing I had to purchase was the uh, shrink marine fittings or, or crimp connections. And as you can see, they're all shrunk around all the wires. Again, everything labeled to where it's going. That's my mood light positive, mood light positive. Anyhow, 
Here's another mood light positive. So with the exception of the marine shrink connections, um, I've had all of this wire in place. There's three blue wires you can see here. They're 10 gauge. They're my main feeds coming off of the fuse panel. There's two main feeds that go into the headlight switch and one main feed that continues over to the ignition switch. They're all 10 gauge. Um, everything else in here is 14 gauge. I had three quarters of a spool of red left. I, I don't remember buying it, but I had one. It was brand new. And I had a complete brand new spool of black. So I've been running, obviously, most of my wiring in that. Uh, I also had probably half a spool of the 10 gauge in blue. So everything at this point, I haven't had to spend a penny on this wiring as far as buying wire. Um, I'm at the point now where I've used up most all of my 14 gauge uh, and I've got some long runs to do. I've got to come off my switch with two 14 gauge wires that run to my bilge pumps clear in the back. So I got to buy more wire for that. I need a 14 gauge run from the back of the tack for my signal wire back to the motor. Um, so I've got to pick up some more wire. I have to get some 16 gauge for my speaker wires to run the other three speakers. I've got just this one connected right now. Um, so everywhere where there is a wire to wire connection, such as the ground wire right here for my uh, stereo, for the media receiver, is soldered and heat shrunk. Here's my, my pain, or my pain, my main uh, hot and my ACC hot. You can see that they've both been soldered and heat shrunk. So any place a wire goes to a wire is soldered and heat shrunk. And then every other connection in the boat is the uh, sealed shrink marine electrical connectors. So anyhow, making good progress. Um, so far, I'm in this wiring for the zip very, very, very little. Um, by the time everything's said and done, I might have... With the cost of the electrical con connections, the marine connections, and a few spools of wire that I have to buy, I might be in this wiring setup a hundred bucks to wire the boat. So, pretty cost effective, but unlike a lot of people, I happen to have a gigantic box of very, very usable wire and some new wire. So, making good progress. Check out my spaghetti. Trust me, it's going to be beautiful when it's done. Have I ever let you guys down? It's gonna be beautiful. All right, well, it's officially August 1st, 2016 for the month of July. We went up 17 hours. Um, we've got a new category, seats. Um, so we went up eight and a quarter hours on the seats. And uh, we also added 8.75 into the electrical. So we're up to 21.75 hours into the electrical. We went up 14 whole dollars, $14.17 this month, and that was just uh, for a roll of speaker wire and some zip ties. That was about it. Um, so $14.17. That brings our grand total in the zip up to $6,193.87. And the 17 hours total that we went into the boat today uh, or this month, I'm sorry, the month of July, brings us up to 500 hours even. So we got another mile marker, 500 hour mark. Um, and I purposefully tried to put in enough hours to hit that 500 hour mark. <laughs> so we'll show you a quick update of where we are. So the last couple of days I had um, working on this boat, the 15th and the 16th, I spent... Uh, on my seat bases, you can now see I have the little blocks glued to it. Um, they are countersunk and pre-bored, ready for screws. There are six per base, two in each one of these sections. So they'll be, it'll be screwed to the floor uh, with six screws to the floor planking, and then there'll be two screws in each side, screwing it to the armrest. So each seat base will have ten screws attaching it to the boat. It'll be very, very solid, uh, but still removable. That's the important part, still removable. Um, so we got those little blocks on. I still have to do some, some little blocks. One here, one here, 
one here, one here. Basically, it'll fill that section so that the back of my ply sub for the seat has something to sit on. It won't actually rest on this lip. So I'm going to put little, little blocks that are glued to it that it'll sit on back here because my seat back will actually set on the top of that. So aside from that, uh, filling in with some famo wood all of my 16 gauge brad nail holes that hold, held all these together while the epoxy cured. Um, and then giving an epoxy coat, the seat bases are pretty much done. The rear seat is done exactly the same. You can see it's got the same blocks. Um, six on here. I'll do the same thing with two through the sides of it to each armrest. I also picked up some speaker wire. Again, this is none of this is harnessed up. It's all here loose. Um, and I've got the remaining three speakers all wired in. So now all four speakers are wired in as well as my power uh, and my ACC and ground to the deck. So that's all fully functional now. Uh, I still have to run my RCA jacks or patch cords from the deck across here and over to the amp. I'll still have to run my remote wire from the deck over to the amp. And then I'll have to build my sub box, get my, my uh, shallow mount tens in there. And they're dual voice coils, so I'm going to seri series wire the coils and then parallel the subs to the a one ohm, it'll be a two ohm load on the amp, that's what the amp's stable at. Um, but it's, again, it's a thousand watt class D mono block, and I'll be running the two kicker red line shallow mount tens on a thousand watts at a two ohm load. So I still got a little bit of wiring to do there. I still have, from the back of my, my headlight switch, I still have to run my dual bilge pump wires to the rear. I have to run a wire to the rear for, um, let's see, bilge pumps. Oh, from the ignition switch and the start, there'll be a wire coming off of each one of those back to the outboard. A um, few little miscellaneous things I have left to do. My signal wire from the tack needs to be ran. I still have to drill my hole in the transom and run my pitot tube up to the back of the speedometer. But... Uh, we're making good progress. You know, I was thinking earlier today, there's not a whole heck of a lot of structural stuff to do. I mean, aside from the seat bases, I can't think of a whole heck of a lot that's left um, structurally. I mean, we'll, we'll still, again, we have to do all of the sub deck and we have to do all of the mahogany veneer on the deck and the fill work, but we're almost done electrically few wire runs left to do and then we'll harness all of this stuff up again and make a, a really clean nice harness for the boat um so a little bit of electrical mechanical wise all i really need to do is route my cable just install it um i've got to pick up my bilge pumps and plumb those up into the motor well um i've got to run my fuel line but we're getting really close, really close. Um, obviously, I still have to do my stainless transom bands, and I'm going to build my stainless cut water for up the bow. But we're getting close. I mean, we're not too far off. And then, of course, after everything's built, then all of the bright work that you'll see in here, I'll have to coat with some sort of UV protection. But all of the floorboards still need to come out and be encapsulated in epoxy and then same thing uv protected we're making great progress thank you for watching um just got back from my well i didn't really go anywhere but just finished up my vacation two weeks with the kids doing all kinds of fun stuff so uh of course i took video of all of that little clips here and there of everything we did each day i'll probably mash all that together in a video and upload it if anybody wants to see what we did um, but thank you for watching um if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please subscribe, rate, comment, and we will catch you on the next update of Building the Zip.